Welcome to the story of Red Hot Chili Peppers. This is a public service. Go! In new music we trust on BBC Radio 1. In new music we trust on BBC Radio 1. Trust us to bring you the best new music. From across the UK and from around the world. They are undeniably one of the most successful bands in rock history. Over the last three decades, they've sold over 60 million albums and had over 117 million YouTube clicks. With their unique sounds of punk and funk, they've gathered a huge following of fans from all over the world. I remember when I was a little boy, I walked in on my dad watching some um, footage of them. They all had the big mohawks and they were shirtless and just going mad and I'd never seen anything like that before and it was scary. They've got radio friendly tunes, they've got obscure songs. I think Under the Bridge, probably the first song that I saw them play on video in New Zealand and my mates and I were like, oh, who's that band? I love them, you know. I think they have a very distinctive sound. I think Anthony Kiedis has got a very distinctive voice. I uh, love his lyrics. Californication, that album, I think it was, I was 16 when that came out and I just absolutely loved it. It kind of like defined that summer for me, summer of 2000. Yeah, I've got to say like, By The Way was probably my favourite album. One of, one of those bands that's hard not to like, really. Right now on Radio 1, we bring you the definitive story of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. We're going to take you right back to the beginning, to Los Angeles, where it all began. I was a guitarist before I even knew what a guitarist was. I had voices in my head always telling me, when you grow up, you're going to be a rock star. By the age of 12, I thought that crime and just fighting the establishment seemed like a pretty good vocation. And then by proxy, I became a bandsman. Spawned out of the L.A. skate punk scene of the 1980s, the Red Hot Chili Peppers got their unique sound from breaking all the rules, fusing the energy and attitude of punk with the smooth grooves of funk. They were straight energy knucklehead. I mean, they just bang, 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 and I thought he was going to kill himself. James Brown is funk. George Clinton is funk. The Chili Peppers are funky. The band have fans from every background, rock, hip-hop, pop, and punk, and they've inspired many musicians over their 23 years career. We were trying to figure out a name to name Black Eyed Peas, you know. I was like, well, Red Hot Chili Peppers is food. <laughs> they kind of made it cool to name your group after a piece of food. Hello, I'm Luke from the Kicks. I was uh, a big fan of Chili Peppers when I was, when I was younger, definitely. I always liked, uh, I mean, Blood Sugar like Sex Magic was uh, an album I played loads and when I was at school, you know. Big band for me, like, in terms of getting into to music. Hey, I'm Max and I play guitar in New Me at Six. Yeah, I'd definitely say the Red Hot Chili Peppers inspired me musically, especially as a guitar player. Like, John Frusciante was one of the very peculiar guitar players that I was growing up listening to. He had a, he had a different style compared to a lot of other guitarists. It was just, it's only a John Frusciante style of playing. You can't imitate that style. It's, it's a very, I don't know, it's a very key thing, you know? Like, I think we've taken a lot of styles of writing looking back at it now from Chili Peppers kinds of ways and how they structure a song and how the feel of a song goes, you know? So I'd say definitely they've inspired Unit 6 and guitar playing wise. Chili Peppers, as they are today, are Anthony Kiedis, Josh Klinghoffer, Chad Smith, and Michael Balzari, better known as Flea. But in the past, there have been quite a few others, most notably Hillel Slovak and John Frusciante. 
The band first formed in 1983, but the guys were destined to be performers from a much earlier age. I knew way back that Anthony would be an entertainer someday. He would go shopping with his little sister and do cartwheels in the department store and embarrass her to death. I'm Peggy Idema. I'm Anthony's mom. And I'm Pat, and I'm Flea's mom. I'm Gail. I'm John Frusciante's mom from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Michael wanted to practice playing his trumpet, and we lived in the country, and there was a big cornfield behind us, and Michael would take a stool from the kitchen and go out in the middle of the cornfield to practice his trumpet. The first I even knew about bass playing was my husband at the time. He saw Michael walking down the street carrying a bass case. This was during school time, and I was kind of disappointed when he started playing punk rock and everything else. I wasn't very happy about it. I brought some photos and also some drawings that Johnny did when he was a little tot. He was around six, seven years old, and there are um, bands like Kiss and Robert Plant. We have The Who. Very intricate pictures of these uh, rock and roll musicians that he loved. I'm John Frusciante. People would ask what I wanted to be. I would say, like, I want to be an actor or I want to be a skateboarder. But then as music started meaning so much more to me when, when I came upon punk rock, the germs and the Sex Pistols and the Clash and Black Flag and things like this, that was when it, it started to make sense. Wow, I could be a guitar player. And by the time I was 12, that was when I wanted it more than anything in the world. My name is Anthony Kiedis. Eight years old, I just wanted to play and think by 10 or 11. I, I thought that you could be a movie star if you wanted to, which sounded interesting. I didn't realize that there was acting involved. Shortly after that, I, I wanted to be anti-establishment. By the age of 12, I, I thought that crime and just fighting the establishment seemed like a pretty good vocation. And then by proxy, I became a bandsman. You know, because my friends had actually had better sense than me early on and they started practicing instruments and things. The founding members of the band, Anthony Flea, Hillel Slovak and Jack Irons, met at Fairfax High School in West Hollywood and it was here that their journey to rock fame began. My name's Dennis Furlong. We're walking down the halls of uh, Fairfax High School. They were all in my math classes back in the late 70s. This was actually my room right here, beautiful room 209. You want to take a peek in? there here in the classrooms of fairfax high once sat phil specter drew barrymore and demi moore but it's the red hot chili peppers that the teaching staff remember the best they would play at school set up out here on the amphitheater and play maybe a concert at lunchtime one day or something we used to have a talent show and it would be like a russian guy would come out and play the guitar you know like a folk song kind of a thing and then the korean kids would do what was called a fan dance and the closing act would be they weren't called the red hot chili peppers but it would be the red hot chili peppers basically one of the guy's best friends was tree i went to junior high school and high school with anthony and with flea and with uh, Hillel and with Jack. That started around 1977. Flea played trumpet in band and orchestra. There used to be a band that used to lip sync to Kiss. Jack was in that and Hillel was in that, I think. And then there was a high school rock band and the name of the high school rock band was Anthem. Anthony introduced Anthem. That happened. He didn't really rap with the band, but he would come up with uh, you know, some sort of, of uh, clever intro. Their parents call them trouble. Their teachers call them crazy. The girls call them all the time. But I call them like I see them. And I call them Anthem. And that's actually kind of like Anthony's entree to the whole scene. Anthony had moved to L.A. from Michigan when he was 12 to live with his father, Blackie Dammit. Blackie was an actor, party animal, and friend of the stars. So life at home for Anthony was far from ordinary. 937 Palm is where we live. Palm is one of the streets right off the Sunset Strip, two blocks from the, the Whiskey A Go Go, the Roxy, the Rainbow, all the Sunset Strip clubs. I was a big party guy, and even though he was only 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, he had to endure these all night parties almost every single night. There would be strippers, models, movie stars, rock stars, some illicit substances. And the people that would be at these parties would be Robert Plant, Keith Moon, Alice Cooper, 
A lot of people like that. David Weaver was Blackie's best friend and a musician who played the clubs on the Sunset Strip. Blackie took him everywhere. He's probably the only 10 or 12 year old kid that walk in and out of the whiskey and in and out of the Rainbow Bar and Grill. And later on, Carlos and Charlie's and stuff. No other kid could do that. You know, you had to be an adult to be in those places. He'd just mosey in and out of there like, uh, like he owned the place. My name is Tony Bassio. In 73, I worked to Whiskey A Go Go as a manager. Then in 1974, I became manager of the Rainbow. In those days, we had from the Beatles all the way, Les Zeppelin, The Who, you name them. Every artist in the world, they used to come over here in them days to do recording. Got Anthony, he's clear. you know, his father was uh, an actor, so he used to bring him in here and, uh, and set him on this table, on the front table by the fireplace. And uh, he used to dress him up with a suit and a tie and a hat like him. So Anthony spent his childhood with one foot in the Rainbow Bar with its celebrities and drugs and the other out in the streets of West Hollywood hanging with his best friend, Flea. Flea is the other half of the two-headed monster. He was this, you know, very small little guy from Australia. And I think it was just, he was diminutive and a flea is a diminutive as you can get. And he just was like weird looking and I went, oh boy, I just knew we should get him into Beverly Hills. Look what happened. He's coming home with a guy like this. Anthony and Flea were pranksters and got up to all kinds of dangerous antics in the name of fun. It was Flea's mom, Pat, who had to pick up the pieces. He and my son thought it was a really good idea to go around to the big apartment buildings, get up onto the top balconies and jump off into the swimming pools. This is what they did after school. And it kind of came to a stop when Anthony broke his back. They didn't keep doing it after that. They were just Southern Californian schoolboys, skateboarding, getting into trouble, playing in their band, and listening to music. At the time, rap was just reaching the West Coast. And when Anthony started listening to Grandmaster Flash and the Sugar Hill Gang, he became inspired. The advent of uh, rap in the 70s and early 80s started with uh, the Sugar Hill Gang. Going a hip, a hop, a hip, hip it to the hip, hip, hop, you don't stop, or, uh, that sort of thing. I think Anthony saw something that he could compose and that he could uh, participate with the music group with. And so the band was born, and they decided to get themselves a gig. It was one night only, and they changed their name from Anthem to Tony Flo and the miraculous, majestic Masters of Mayhem. Hula! The first time they played was the Rhythm Lounge on Melrose, and they asked this new incarnation of Anthem with Anthony doing rap if they would perform. They only knew one song. It was out in L.A., and they came and performed, and everybody just went nuts. At that point, they thought it was about time they came up with a proper name. They've never really fessed up as to where the name came from. Anthony used to say they got it from a burning bush in the Hollywood Hills, a biblical reference. But most likely, they took it from the 20s, 30s black bands like the Hot Chilies and the Red Hots and stuff like that. And because Flea, you know, had this tremendous jazz background, um, I think he's the one that came up with that. Or did he? I seem to recall that I came up with the name. Anthony and I are walking around Hollywood one day and like, uh, well, what should you call this band? What should I call this band? And I think my call was Red Hot Chili Peppers. It seems to me I was thinking that time of a classic jazz band called Chelly Roll Morton and his Red Hot Peppers. And uh, something about the concept of it, which already included uh, like a sexual content and a funky content, something about it uh, seemed right to me. The music scene in the 1980s consisted mostly of glam rock and hair metal bands, neither of which ever appealed to the young Chili Peppers. I remember taking him to see Guns N' Roses at the Troubadour, and he and Flea came in uh, ponchos and sandals. Everybody else was, you know, spandex. They listened to a couple songs and said, oh, this isn't our cup of tea, and uh, walked off. And so bands like the Chili's and Jane's Addiction started forming their own scene. The two bands became friends and have enjoyed a special relationship ever since. Here's Jane's Addiction front 
frontman and founder of the Lollapalooza Festival, Perry Farrell. We were all more part of a real music scene. One that was an alternative to the obvious sights and sounds of the Sunset Strip, which had become essentially hair bands. Groups like Guns N' Roses grew out of that particular scene and were performing in traditional rock venues. But the Peppers and Janes would play at the out-of-the-ordinary spots that were proprietized by downtown underground promoters who catered to the art world with lots of gay people and other creative souls. The scene gathered a following of skateboarders and kids who never 